It's one of the new crimes of the times. Congresswoman Marionette Miller Meeks will be here to talk about it, about what we all need to do to stop hackers that have impacted food, fuel, and classes. Plus, why one county felt like it was time to give people the chance to win money for them to get vaccinated. And on this Father's Day, what you would like to do with dad. From your local election headquarters, this is the Insiders with Dave Price. So far this year, the hackers are striking. DMACC students couldn't take their online classes for several days. JBS shut down its meat plants and Colonial Pipeline's fuel stopped flowing for a couple of days. Now, JBS and Colonial Pipeline both admitted that they paid millions of dollars to the hackers so that the companies could once again regain access to their systems. Iowa Congresswoman Marionette Miller Meeks says stopping future attacks has to be a national priority. Whenever you pay the ransomware attack, that just begets more attacks with higher and higher uh, payouts. So it's a tremendous issue. Also the training uh, for cybersecurity, and then all of us have a responsibility to take our, you know, our passwords and uh, internet security much more seriously than we have in the past, especially as an employee. Uh, you know, uh, phishing attacks that come about, uh, having that education and training is something that we all need to be invested in as a country. Is it Russia? Is this where this is originating? Well, certainly everything in the Colonial Pipeline and in this most recent attack on JBS uh, does indicate that it's uh, Russia, whether it's the Russian mafia. Um, you know, there's not indication that it's state sponsored, but nonetheless, President Biden has a tremendous opportunity right now at the G7 summit to really put pressure on, uh, you know, on Russia, on uh, Vladimir, President Putin, Vladimir Putin, in order to stop ransomware attacks and stop, uh, you know, uh, that dark undercurrent uh, of ransomware and hackers uh, that are Russian based. But if President Putin is denying that it is originating there or saying that he doesn't know anything about it, do you feel confident that President Biden can get something to change here to stop it if we don't get the, the help of the Russian leader to, to, to assist with this? Well, it's a great question, but you know, all the intelligence information indicates uh, that this was Russian in origination. We also have, uh, you know, not on cybersecurity, but on security in general, we have the Wall Street Journal reports of uh, Russian disinformation in regards to the COVID-19 vaccines. So we know that it, it exists. We know that this is part of the uh, of the framework uh, of you know uh, Russian companies, Rus Russian businesses, whether it's Russian mafia, and certainly uh, you know uh, President Putin is aware of these things and can take action. If they don't have uh, secure enough laws in order uh, to prevent hacking and uh, to support cybersecurity, this is not just a U.S. problem. This is an international problem. And at the G7 summit, as I said, it's a tremendous opportunity for not only uh, President Biden, but other countries to put pressure on Russia. You mentioned COVID-19. As you sit here at this moment, do you believe that COVID-19 originated in that lab in China? Does it look more like that that is what happened in your mind? Yes, I believe that uh, the virus originated in the laboratory. Uh, I remember March uh, and April of last year, I was communicating and texting with other physicians uh, about the possibility. We had read uh, the, um, the journal report from the two scientists uh, in China uh, that had stated it had originated from the, the lab. And I think everything points to that, uh, especially uh, China's, uh, the Chinese Communist Party's denial uh, that it emanated from the lab, their disinformation campaign early on, uh, the fact that there was uh, circuitous funding to the Wuhan Institute of Virology, the lack of an intermediate uh, host. Uh, we don't have an intermediate host at this point in time. And the knowledge that there had been previous uh, breaks in security, lack security uh, and leaks in this laboratory before, I think all point to, to that. And we need to know, it needs to be investigated and for a variety of reasons. One, public health. We need to know from a public health standpoint where the virus originated and if it was man-made. Um, we need to know from a national security standpoint. Uh, you know, people often are concerned about, uh, you know, uh, nuclear um, uh, weapons, but we really need to be concerned about biosecurity, biohazards, 
uh, and, um, and uh, you know, chemical attacks as well. This is all part of our national security framework. And then I think the third thing and the third reason we need to know is that early on, um, the fact that it could originate from a laboratory uh, in uh, China and be suppressed by the Chinese Communist Party was dismissed. Uh, the media dismissed it, other individuals dismissed it. And I think we all need to take a look in the mirror and not dismiss uh, information just because we don't like the source of that information. Uh, so I think it's very important in that regard. And I really would like to um, highlight Senator Joni Ernst and putting forward an amendment uh, that would uh, prohibit taxpayer funding from going to um, fund the Wuhan Institute of Virology, uh, even if it goes through the NIH or the um, NIAID. So what, what is next with this? Will, how will our country ever truly get to the bottom of this if there's not the full cooperation from Chinese leaders themselves? I think part of that is that we know that the uh, World Health Organization or WHO is compromised. So even early on, uh, they were denying that there was human to human transmission of the virus. Um, which we know, of course, there was. Um, they um, really helped China to suppress information and provide disinformation to the world. And so I think that you look to international sources um, in order to pressure China to allow uh, researchers, U.S. researchers, U.S. scientists to be able to examine the lab. We're not going to get all of the information we need, uh, but we do need to know if the virus originated there and if it was man-made. I think that is tremendously important. So. Um, I think putting pressure on the World Health Organization, uh, the Chinese Communist Party's stature in other international organizations, be it WHO, be it World Trade Organization, be it IMF, I think there, you know, be it in the UN, in the UN Security Council, there are ways to put pressure on the Chinese Communist Party so that they allow a more transparent investigation uh, into where the virus originated, how it originated, and then how do we um, have uh, more pressure on the Chinese Communist Party to increase the security um, of this laboratory. So is research going on on a level two that needs to be going on in a level four and a, and a level four uh, laboratory space? So I think those things are important. And I think that using our international community, we can certainly put pressure on the Chinese Communist Party uh, to help provide more information, get more information, get uh, American scientists to investigate or to pick a neutral party, but not the uh, World Health Organization because they've already been compromised. As people keep looking into the origins of this and just looking back over the past year at the response along with it, you have some of your colleagues who are pushing this uh, effort to fire, to uh, replace Anthony Fauci uh, because of some of the early communications he had where he talked about, for example, everybody didn't, didn't need to wear a mask um, early on. Uh, are, do you support this? Should he be removed from any leadership role? Well, I certainly think that we need to have that discussion. Uh, you know, as director of the Iowa Department of Public Health, one of the things I conveyed to my staff was that we needed to always maintain our credibility. And the way that you do that is to be transparent. So sometimes when you don't know the answer, the answer is we don't know the answer. So um, where there is, um, you know, discussion about masks and the effectiveness of masks, I think that you bring that up and uh, you do it in a transparent manner that, you know, uh, the effectiveness is at this level. The research shows this, but we still recommend this. And the same thing when I asked questions of Dr. Fauci and Dr. Walensky of herd immunity, and this was in April and really got a non-answer. But, you know, Iowa is an agricultural state. And if any state and its people know about herd immunity, it's Iowa. So we know that there's uh, herd immunity. We know that there are, there's a level that we're trying to ascertain. And when you look at the experience out of Israel, that gives us some good guidance. So I think that there was certainly communication that could have gone on that many of us in the medical community were kind of scratching our heads at why if uh, someone's been fully vaccinated, do they still need to wear a mask? Are we that concerned about COVID-19 variants? And you know, are these vaccines not effective? And I think it undercut you know, when um, when Dr. Fauci said that even after everyone is fully vaccinated, we're still going to be wearing masks until 2022, that really did, um, I think, um, make more vaccine hesitancy. If we didn't trust the vaccine, um, then uh, why would we be recommending for people to get uh, vaccinated against COVID-19? So I think 
those that type of information, that lack of transparency, I think hurt us in how we uh, how we got through the pandemic. And then also when we're talking about recovery from the pandemic, how we recover from the pandemic, how we continue to get people uh, to be vaccinated, which I think is still very important for us to continue to do both in Iowa and in the nation. And you've you've expressed the importance of getting vaccinated. You've been vaccinated. You have actually vaccinated people uh, throughout your district when you're when you're back home. I'm curious what you make about uh, like Polk County, for example, along with some other jurisdictions locally and then outside our borders. Some of the other states are putting together almost lotteries where if you go get vaccinated, you have a chance to win something. What do you think of that effort? You know, I think anything that incents people to get vaccinated, I would, you know, I, I'm not going to be critical of, of those efforts at all, whether it's a an employer, uh, whether it's a city, uh, whether, you know, it, it's a state. So whatever mechanism they're doing, because the more people that are vaccinated, the better we're all going to do, not only here uh, within our state of Iowa or within our nation, but globally. Uh, this is a global pandemic pandemic. It affects many individuals. And I fully support, uh, you know, uh, having unused uh, vaccines go to other countries. I fully support those efforts as well, too. This is one of those uh, uh, times when we all need to work and pull together. So I'm not going to dismiss anybody's effort to get people vaccinated. As long as they're transparent, they're honest, they discuss the side effects, and we're not doing it in a manner that shames or ridicules people. I think it's very important to respect where people are and then try to uh, discuss with them the benefits of being vaccinated, the benefits of being vaccinated, uh, even if there's still an op a chance low that you would get COVID-19, the long-term side effects of getting COVID-19 and the side effects of the vac vaccine. I think all of that should be done in a transparent, knowledgeable way. And we're going to talk to a county leader about ways to incentivize residents to get vaccinated. We'll do that a little bit later. But first, the congresswoman's back on why she thinks it could be a while before employers see the benefits of the unemployed no longer getting that extra $300 per week. We'll talk to her about that next.